Okay, so the first thing I want to do is um, apologize about the snafu with the vocab quiz uh, this weekend. I was, just, I was so focused on this conference I was going to that I just forgot to post the quiz. So it's posted now. Uh, just take it by Wednesday night. And again, there's, there's no real pressure here um, because we've already done 10 of these. So you know, this is mostly just going to be you know, to help build your knowledge base for the final exam. Um, and I will give you a vocab sheet um, to help you study for the exam on the, last, on the next to last day of class. Um, so you can bring that along when we do the review session on the final day. Um, and you know, let me know if you have any questions. Um, I have also given everyone a set of sample um, exam essay questions. So just like with the midterm, uh, the, the actual questions on the exam are going to be more specific. But this will at least give you some sense of what broad themes are going to pop up, right? And can you know, kind of suggest directions that you can take for the, the final exam essay. So does anybody have any questions about the final exam? Is the big main question also a 500 word thing just like the first? Time or is it going to have to be longer this time through? No, they're they're both they're going to you're going to have to answer two out of three. Oh, and okay. they're going to they're both going to be five hundred words. Okay. So yeah, it, it is it is going to be longer, but you're going to be answering two questions rather than just one, and you'll be doing ten IDs rather than eight. Otherwise, the instructions are. I do want to remind everybody, too, that the annotated bibliography is due on Friday for paper two. And so this is the reading assignment for next time. These are the poems that Kaylee is going to be covering in her presentation. So just be prepared for that. I would also like to ask everybody to please uh, complete the course evaluations. You should have had an email about this uh, probably over the weekend. Um, and you know, just like, there is no harm that you can do to me emotionally or otherwise, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, you know, it's just, you know, be honest about your experience in the class. Um, you know, it's not going to hurt my feelings. It's not going to get me fired. Um, it's just, you know, it's going to let me know what sorts of things I need to focus on in future semesters, right? Um, I hope that you all have enjoyed the class and feel like you've got something out of it. And if so, um, please tell your friends that that was the case because we've had low enrollments the last couple semesters. <laughs> I think that people have an impression that this class is really hard, and so they don't take it, they take something else instead. It's, <laughs> it's, just, it's not hard, it's just like focused, you know what I mean? But like, you want that in a class or you won't learn anything. <laughs> but yeah, if you, if you yeah, if you had a good experience, please tell your friends that this court, this class was not scary. <laughs> um, yeah, and I guess that's uh, otherwise uh, basically it here. So um, let's go ahead and talk about uh, Doris Lessing. So what y'all think? Who wants to start? Um, I felt a lot of emotions. <laughs> <laughs> so just it, 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 it was like a, a roller coaster. Feelings. Okay. <laughs> A lot of, I think at the end I was, it actually made me, cr like I teared up because I was angry. Uh -huh. Like I was just angry with the whole, okay. <laughs> the whole story. Okay. What, and let's, let's try to trace that then. It's like, what, what about the story made you feel so angry? Um, I guess they just don't really consider her as much. Like they're considering uh -huh. her and the fact that they try to respect her and like what she's doing, but at the same time she doesn't have that like with the whole her husband situation and then uh -huh. the kids and like um what was the what was the um servant's name not servant but the the charwoman yeah yes the, the um yeah. it's kind of like she's easily replaced i guess like they don't consider uh -huh. her emotions as a person i guess 
Okay. Did that make sense? <laughs> that was kind of a mm-hmm. confusing explanation, but... Yeah, no, but I, I, I think it's interesting here that you're focusing on um, emotions and feelings, especially kind of like when we look at the first page or so of the story, right? And what what is the Rawlings marriage initially based on? Intelligence. Yeah. It's a match based on intelligence, right? And we keep seeing all these words pop up like sensible, right? They make a sensible choice and balanced and reasonable. I don't know, I found this story interesting and I was upset from but on a totally different side. Like uh-huh. I could understand her needing like a little bit of space and a little bit of time like to uh-huh. think and to process. But I was so mad that she like completely disconnected from her whole yeah. family and like mm-hmm. she was unwilling to tell anybody when she was struggling and then she uh-huh. ends up committing suicide and it's kinda of yeah. like well, I think they would have cared about you and they would like they might have thought, I don't uh-huh. understand this, but at least they probably wouldn't yeah. be like so confused uh-huh. in the end. Like she just completely withdrew and I, I was like I kind of found it like upsetting that she just hired somebody to look out for her children. Yes. Like, uh-huh. That she didn't care enough to have a relationship like keep that relationship with them, I guess. Too. <laughs> okay, th- 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 think about it too, and it's, it's like you know when Sophie Traub is hired, right? She's getting paid to do these things that Susan was doing in the house for no compensation, right? Mm-hmm. So <clears throat> you've got a paid au pair here replacing the mother who's just supposed to to do these things out of the goodness of her heart, right? Mm-hmm. So like, can we actually cite Susan Rawlings in a pattern that we've discussed in this class? Uh, the angel in the house, maybe? <laughs> yeah, I mean like, even though she's not really supposed to be in that role, right? That's not supposed to exist anymore that is kind of what she gets slotted into, right? And this whole idea of disinterested kindness. Like, um, for example, we talk about like the mother's room episode here. Let, let, let's let's kind of uh, shift to there for a second. What's the whole idea behind mother's room? It's like this room that she made up and the children, like they had to have a discussions with the children um, about not messing with her. And they even have uh-huh. like, this thing that goes on, they run up the stairs and they're like, oh no, like, uh-huh. be quiet. Yeah. So. so yeah, so what's supposed to be the purpose of this room? She's supposed to have her quiet space. Yeah, it's just supposed to be like some quiet private space for her, right? But what does it become? A family room. Eventually it becomes a family room, right? But even before that, what does it become? Is the room really for her, ever? <laughs> Let's, I'm looking for, for where it is in the... Uh... Right, so if we look on page 910, right? What it amounted to was that mother's room and her need for privacy had become a valuable lesson in respect for other people's rights. Quite soon, Susan was going up to the room only because it was a lesson. It was a pity to drop. Then she took up sewing there, and the children of Mrs. Parks came in and out, and it had become another family room. So, what do you what what what, what do we make of this? Right. So even like this private space she's supposed to have in the house. It's a teaching point. <laughs> yeah. It's a lesson for the children, right? It's not for her, it's for someone else. Mm -hmm. Much like with the angel in the house, right? Who, you know, if we look back at Virginia Woolf's Professions for Women, right? You know, if there's a draft, she's supposed to sit in it. If there's chicken for dinner, she's supposed to take the worst piece, right? And give the good parts to everyone else. Um, And, you know, she's just supposed to be kind and loving and good for the sake of everyone else. 
think yeah, part of the issue here is that Susan Rawlings is not being permitted to just, you know, be Susan, right? She has to be Matthew's wife. She has to be the children's mother. Uh, she has to be Mrs. Parks' boss, right? And she's defined by this web of family relations rather than as an individual with her own thoughts, feelings, and ambitions, right? And in fact, like, you know, I think it's probably worth also looking even the paragraph above here, right? Um, you know, when, the, when she comes down to make tea for the children after they have trotted away, uh, you know, shh, that's mother's room, we can't go in there, right? The twins put their arms around her from front to back, and what do they make out of their loving limbs? Oh, a human cage. Yeah. Oh. I get it now. <laughs> <laughs> a human cage of loving limbs. So yeah, like even the children's affection for her feels limited, feels like a prison, right? And then if we look at, um, you know, when she does finally go and take a holiday by herself, right, she takes that walking tour in Wales, and how does that work out for her? They're calling her a bunch, like, yeah. um, what do I do about this, what do I do about this? Yeah, even, yeah, the, 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 the in-home help, right, the person who is supposed to relieve her of responsibilities, keeps calling and asking for instructions, right? And you know, we're, we're, the, 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 the telephone, the, the telephone wire holding her to her duty like a leash, right? So I think one thing that we might want to kind of pull out of this is like kind of like all of this kind of like language of like imprisonment, right? We see the word bondage a lot. Cage. The telephone wire is like a leash. And how might this, and I think, you know, Kaylee, you were kind of talking about this failure on Susan's part to express her emotions to anyone. What do you think holds her back from doing that? Why do you think she doesn't express her emotions? I think one of the things that it said, at least towards the beginning, was something about how like she didn't want to be seen as insensible, like as not being smart. <laughs> In the end, I feel like she accomplished that, of, like not that like mm -hmm. she committed suicide. Like, that's just terrible. Like, it, I feel like people would have thought her to be smarter if she had just said, "I need a little space," uh -huh. or like. I just need a day, or like, <laughs> I here's how I'm cried. feeling. At the end of that, like when I read that, I was like, oh, oh my god. Well, like she leaves all her kids behind. All she wanted alone, like to be alone. And, uh -huh. and one of the things that I was like, I kind of relate, is like, she kind of was like, I just want it to feel like nobody knows where I am. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and like, like, what, let, let's kind of move maybe to that final scene, right? Why does she feel like she has to do that at that moment? Why is this the only way out? From her perspective. Maybe because she's constantly needed or like... I mean, it seems like every time she found a space or took a day to get yeah. away, they found her. They yeah. found her in some way. Mm -hmm. They called her, they, someone knew her somewhere, they were talking to her constantly. And she just went to silence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, I mean, too, like when she uh -huh. wasn't honest with anybody, uh -huh. and then like she purposefully lies and says there's this Michael Plant fellow, yeah, and uh -huh. like then realizes uh -huh. like her husband has been cheating on her and all this sort of stuff and uh -huh. then she's like thinking he wants like he doesn't <laughs> want to be with me like I, she just got so twisted in her mind yeah. from so many well, different things well, and, and, and let's uh, is it even that he doesn't want to be with her that he wants to end the marriage i mean this isn't his first affair right 
this has happened before. And he asked her, like, would you marry him? And he, she was like, no. And he was like, it's hard to imagine being married to someone else, basically. Yeah. It's and kind of strange. And then he wants yeah, them to weird. go on a double date. I know. You know like, <laughs> there's so many things wrong with that. Uh -huh. Like I was so mad with Matthew this whole time. Yeah, I was like, like what mm -hmm. the heck? But again, <laughs> but again, it, 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 it's like, what? Why does Matthew need for their need for her to be having an affair? What does that provide? An explanation. For yes, her behavior. there has to be some explanation for her behavior, right? There has to be some rational reason why she's doing this. And what's the thing that she can't express to him this whole time? That she needs to be alone. Yeah, and that there's no particularly rational reason yeah. for it, right? Reason for it, I just want to yeah. Be left alone. Yeah, she, yeah, but like there, there, there isn't an explanation here to be found. And I think like this is one of the reasons why she has such a hard time articulating to other people what she's feeling, right? Because on like, let's like kind of take stock of what her life looks like from the outside, right? What does Susan Rawlings have that other people would want or would envy? Like a perfect family? Yeah. At least an outwardly perfect family, right? You know, you know Matthew isn't entirely faithful, but uh, you know, they're, they're so intelligent and reasonable, right? That, yeah. <laughs> that this isn't a problem. <laughs> I think they also, kept, every time they would describe him, they kept um, describing him as um, blonde and handsome and attractive. So, like, uh -huh. there was no real reason for her to be upset since he was blonde and attractive. Yeah. <laughs> or even yeah. like her lover, she said, explain, she described him to look like him. And that yeah. was like her saying she really couldn't be with anybody else. Yeah. And she, she fumbles until she finds this ridiculous made-up name, Mike, Michael Plant. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, you could also see, like, even uh -huh. their house would have been yeah. something like, they had this beautiful house with a uh -huh. garden and all these things. Yeah. Like, that could be kind of a symbol of success. They had a servant, at least one, and then, then the second one. So it looks like, oh, wow, you have all this freedom because uh -huh. you don't have to, you know, cook or clean if you don't want to. Yeah. Let's kind of focus on the house here for a second, too, though, right? So the fact that they live in a large suburban house with a garden, might that in some way also contribute to Susan's malaise? What does Matthew get to do every day that Susan doesn't? <laughs> yeah, he gets to get up and go to work, right? Leave the house, go into the city. Whereas she is, you know, stuck with the kids in this beautiful house all day, right? So he is out interacting with other adults of his own, you know, level of education and social rank. He goes to parties, he even occasionally picks up a girl at a party, right? And all of this is experience that is pretty much barred to her, right? Because somebody has to stay home, take care of the house, take care of the kids, and manage the servant. So the house is also a kind of trap, right? And are they in the house? Did they buy this big suburban house in Richmond in the suburbs? Necessarily because they wanted to, or for themselves. Why did they move out there? Because she was pregnant. Uh huh. She said they started having children. Kind of before, and they, before they got married, they both had their own apartment. So then yes. they decided that it wouldn't make sense to live to for someone to move in. Right, because you know, then, then it's like, well, you know, then you know, we have to figure out you know, whose space right. to live in, right? So we'll live in our own little, we'll, we'll get a flat together, and then with the expectation that eventually we'll move out to the suburbs, right? Now, where does that expectation come from? 
Is anybody holding a gun to their head saying, you're going to move to the suburbs or they didn't like it? No. They make all these choices. Mm -hmm. To like start the family, I mean, they could have went without having kids. Yeah, and stayed there, but they uh -huh. still having children. I mean, they they could have had children and stayed in the city too, right? Does it go with that like marriage thing too? Like the whole they talk about the whole center of it is their marriage together. So it's uh -huh. like the household is under them being together, uh -huh. basically. Yeah, except that once they move out to the suburbs, they're actually less together. Right? Mm -hmm. Because Matthew was gone more frequently, and they're not going to, they're not participating in the same social circle and the same social activities anymore. And let's actually kind of look here at the, um, look here at the, at the, the, uh, the bottom of the page, right, page 901. Kind of like what their situation is at the time they get married, right? And so they married amid general rejoicing. They just keep thinking of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. You know, it's like you know, they're in the frozen land of Mador, they were forced to eat Robin's minstrels. And again, there was much rejoicing, right? And so they married amid general rejoicing, and because of their foresight and their sense for what was probable, nothing was a surprise to them. Put a pin in that line, right? Nothing was a surprise to them. Both had well-paid jobs. Matthew was a sub-editor in a large London newspaper, and Susan worked in an advertising firm. He was not the stuff of which editors or published journalists are made, or publicized journalists are made, but he was much more than a sub-editor, being one of the essential background people who in fact steady, inspire, and make possible the people in the limelight. He was content with this position. Susan had a talent for commercial drawing. She was humorous about the advertisement she was responsible for but she did not feel strongly about them one way or the other. Both before they married had pleasant flats, but they felt it unwise to base a marriage on either flat, right? Wise and unwise here, right? it's another one of these intelligence words. Because it might seem like a submission of personality on the part of the one whose flat it was not. They moved into a new flat in South Kensington on the clear understanding that when their marriage had settled down, a process they knew would not take long and was in fact more a humorous concession to popular wisdom than what was due to themselves. They would buy a house and start a family. So why are they going to buy a house when they start a family? What are they making a concession to? Popular wisdom. Yeah, because this is what's conventional, right? This is what people do, right? Middle class people don't stay in the city to raise their children. They buy big houses with gardens in the suburbs. That's the popular wisdom. And they don't do anything that's unexpected, right? Everything they do follows the predictable, sensible path. So there are no surprises for them. Now, And this is going to sound like a weird question, right? You're probably used to this kind of thing by now. What is a surprise? Like, not unplanned, but not expected, I guess. Yeah. yeah. It's an unexpected interruption of the way things are supposed to be going, right? You know, the, of what you expect. Um, so, what would it be like to live a life with no surprises? Boring. <laughs> <laughs> All three of you at once. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would, sit down. No. <laughs> it would be horribly, horribly dull, right? And everybody tells Susan exactly what to expect every step along the way. It's, oh, you know, when the kids are out of that, when the kids are at school, well, then you'll have time for yourself, right? You'll have your life back. Um, and on the one hand, that means that she's constantly expected to wait to actually have her own life and personality, right? Without subordinating it to uh, childcare. Um, but it also means that, like, 
there's a way she's expected to do everything and a way she's expected to feel about everything, right? And so what happens when she doesn't feel the way she's supposed to when the twins finally go off to school? Can't see that bill? Like... Uh-huh. And by, by other people or by herself? By herself. Yeah. And I think like this, this is kind of like what you were noticing, like Kelly, that kind of self-censorship, right? Because like, like she sounds crazy to herself, right? Crazy and irrational and ungrateful because of, you know, the basically like the kind of the ideology that she's absorbed, right? Now, this story is published in 1963. Right, hence the Rolling Stones song about Mother's Little Helper, right? Yeah, 1966, it's a couple of years after, but it's the same you know, general time period, right? So how would we think things would be different for women in 1963 than they were in, say, 1883 or even 1943? In the beginning, she's uh -huh. able to have her own job. And yeah. She has her own job. Right? Her own career before she marries Matthew. And lives independently. I mean, by this time, like you were just saying, women were more independent. They could vote at this time. Yeah. Um, they could live on their own. Mm -hmm. well, it was more socially acceptable to live on their own. Sure. Um, they weren't married by 14. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, I mean, in fact, like, um, uh, Matthew and Susan are in their very sensible late 20s right. when they get married, right? Which is old. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that, that's yeah, part of what, um, like, like, you know, it's, but, it, but it's just the right age, right? Mm -hmm. Because they've had just enough experience of the world, but not enough that they've become jaded yet, right, or desperate. So good for them. <laughs> but yeah, um, and you know, by, by, yeah, by this time, you know, women can vote, they can own property, they have custodial rights over their own children, um, you know, they can go to college and earn a degree. Um, <clears throat> they're able to live independently if they choose. And yet, even with all of this, do the expectations, like, have the expectations that are placed on Susan Rawlings actually changed all that much from the expectations that would have been placed on her great-grandmother or her great-great-grandmother? Hmm. And she was still expected to be a prince and housewife mm -hmm. and mother, you know, cleaning, uh -huh. cooking, raising brats. <laughs> yep. Telling, telling the servant what to do, right? It's, because apparently the servant can't think without her. That was annoying. This part was annoying. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you come to the garden like six times, seven minutes, you're at the cost of one? Do it. If she said it's fine, yeah. like, uh -huh. take her to it's fine. But I, I think that also gives us, um, you know, some evidence of how, you know, like, you know, gender expectations and class structure kind of bump up against each other, right? You know, the working class person is not willing to buck the authority of the middle class boss in any way, right? They're both women, but Mrs. Park's subordinate social position means that she is constantly deferential to Mrs. Rollins in a way that injures both of them, right? So it's a kind of mutually destructive class relationship. She's like afraid to mess up too. Like she talks about, she's like, I don't want to do something wrong. Like, yeah, what but, would you do wrong? <laughs> it, but yeah, in, in that they're alike, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that Mrs. Parks doesn't want to do something wrong in the housework that might displease Susan. But Susan doesn't want to do anything wrong 
that might make her look like she's less intelligent, sensible, balanced, and reasonable than she's supposed to be. So even like, like this new kind of intelligent, tolerant, balanced marriage, right, ends up being a kind of trap. So let's think about, like, like, what does Susan get out of this dingy little hotel room in Fred's hotel? No one knows where she is, so she feels as though she can be free to be whoever uh -huh. she wants. She even changes her name to <laughs> <laughs> So she's like a new uh -huh. person. Yeah. And it gave her, like, some anonymity with, like, other people, like... They didn't need to know that uh, anything about her personal life. They just kind of saw her. Mm -hmm. Or didn't, as the case may be. <laughs> That's true. Because, <laughs> yeah, it's not like she's going into town and socializing. She just, she's, she's, you know, she's going in. She's just getting a room for herself for a couple of hours a few times a week. Um, and... Just sits, yeah. Just sits and does absolutely nothing. I would go crazy. <laughs> <laughs> like, bring a book. Uh -huh. but, like. but, that, but that's the thing, right? Is that like she she's going crazy not doing this, right? This is, seems to be the thing that is giving her a kind of stable center in a universe where she feels like she's just being pulled in different directions all the time. <laughs> and yeah, and yeah, the, the only place that she can do this is this kind of dingy hotel that seems to be mostly frequented by prostitutes and people who are engaged in illicit daytime encounters, right? <laughs> and I think you know we've already kind of hit upon this, right? But like, but. What is it that ruins her little retreat? He gets the detective to come. Yeah, he sends a detective where she is. <laughs> to see to follow her, right? Does that seem like a little much? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> At the same time, I mean, he was giving her a lot of money, and like she just disappeared, and nobody knew what happened uh -huh. to her, yeah. and like. Oh yeah, I think, I need five dollars. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like everyone can tell when people start to disengage from uh -huh. normal life and like you can tell when people are emotionally detached from things. And so like yeah. when you're like, why am I you're like you're using this money, you're disappearing, like you're not involved in the kids' lives anymore. Like there is also the set of like just what is happening because you're clearly not telling me. Uh-huh. Even if it is a little weird to say. <laughs> to track them down. Yeah. I don't know why he chose a detective. Like, why did he go look for her? But it kind of shows that that idea that he doesn't really, like, you know, he still has this mistress uh -huh. and all this stuff, so he didn't take it to himself to look himself. Like, he had to get someone else to do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, what, and, 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 and of course, and, you know, what is the assumption that he's making? That she's cheating on him. Yeah, that she's having an affair, right? Which is kind of weird because he does that too. So yeah. it's like, what? But, be, but because he does that too, yeah. and in fact, apparently, so do most of the people they know, right? Like, what does that make an affair as opposed to going and sitting in a room by yourself for several hours? More reasonable? Yeah, it's, it's normal, right? It's, <laughs> it's something normal people do. Whereas, you know, going and renting a room. <laughs> to sit by yourself for hours <laughs> is not something like normal that. people do. <laughs> I mean, sure None right. of this is normal. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. But yeah, like, it, it doesn't even occur to him that that could be the sort of thing that she's doing, right? That she just wants to be left alone. And what ruins this private space for her is that now he knows about it Right? He doesn't care if she knows. It, it's, it's not about what she does there, right? It's about the fact that you know, like she's finally got this private space. Right? She can't have a private space in the house. She has no private space in her personal life, typically, right? So just the fact that she is able to pay for 
this um, shitty little hotel room a couple times a week just to sit and be quiet and have no one bother her or even know that she exists at all, right? And I think there's a, there's a reason why this is Susan's particular form of retreat, right? So what was the name of the Virginia Woolf text that we were reading excerpts from last time? Mm -hmm. Aha! <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> yeah. And, you know, like a big part of Wolf's argument, in fact, like where the, where the title comes from, is that in order to create, you need a couple of things, right? You need a private space, you need uninterrupted leisure time, and your own income. I mean, it also kind of connects back to Virginia Woolf as well. I guess because Susan is also like an artist in a way too. Yeah, yeah, that, that's, yeah, yeah. She, she was, yeah, she was a commercial artist for an advertising firm before she had kids, yeah. This is all too familiar to me. <laughs> <laughs> and then like, like Wolf herself, yeah, she ends up committing suicide. Um, but yeah, um, and let's kind of think about like why this sort of thing is necessary for creativity, right? Why do you need private space, uninterrupted stretches of time, and your own money in order to be a creative or to be a writer? I mean, to really expand your mind and be creative you need that time to do like there's no other pressures like there's no other things to do uh -huh. and it's kind of like that private zone you have to be in like this quiet space uh -huh. and then you need income because how are you going to be successful in that like without Right, right, because the, the, there are going to be, yeah, you're going to have to pay for materials, mm -hmm. and there are going to be periods in which, you know, you are not selling your work, right? You know, you are, you know, if you're simply creating, like, you can't sell what's not created yet. Or to get better, like, you can't, yeah. you have to make separate things to get better at it, like, you can't just automatically have this wonderful, amazing piece about uh -huh. having yeah, with, with that, without a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, there, there's a lot, a lot of effort goes into art, literary, or otherwise. Um, you know, yeah, pe people don't just, just wake up and produce masterpieces. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> Why would it be here? <laughs> yeah, what, would, what would you need college for? Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and, and that's, the, that's, that's, that's the thing. Is it like, um, so, like, I don't know, like, do any of you live in a house with small children? I have baby cousins that visit really. Okay. That's and yeah, and, and it's and yeah, and, 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 yeah kid, kids are tiny sociopaths. Right? Yes, they they're like yeah, little they, dogs. They run around everywhere. <laughs> yeah, and they just and they, they right they're they're needy. You know, not their fault. I mean, it's the kind of state of development they're in, right? But they need attention. They need affection. They need to be fed. They need to be played with. You know, they are like dogs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they and they need intellectual stimulation, right? And if you're the person who's responsible for giving that to them, how likely is it that you're going to be able to find space in your day to sit down and write or to, you know, sit down and paint or sculpt or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. Or even to think of things that you can, like, this is part of Wolf's argument as to why there have been so few great women writers historically, is because it's the work that women were always expected to do was too distracting and allowed them no private space. That's like, this is kind of my own personal thing, but like the beginning of the semester, uh -huh. I lived with them. Like I don't live with my aunt because I just couldn't afford to dorm here yet. But uh -huh. anyway, so I got no homework done because they would just be running in and out of the room. Like uh -huh. 
Peyton, look at this. Peyton, look at this. I'm like, oh. <laughs> right. Well, right. And you know, when when you know, and when their cool older cousin moves in, right? Yeah. That's exciting. Yeah. And they they and want I'm to so impress you. Yeah. So uh -huh. I know so much, and they uh -huh. want to get everything from me. <laughs> No, I, I remember, yeah, I remember how, how that, that was, I remember that when I was a kid, you know, my, my cousins, Chris and Eric, were like a good, like, you know, eight and six years older than I was, so everything they did was awesome. Yeah. I, I just, yeah, I just, you know, I, I wanted to follow them around, yeah, and, you know, and, you know, to their credit, like, they were very kind and patient and tolerant, but, you know, it's, but, yeah. It, you kind of have to be. Yeah, there, 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 there's, there, there, yeah there, there's, there, there's no way they could have got anything done with their little cousins around, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, and, and, you know, I, I think what, like, the other thing that is the, a big influence on this, right, is kind of the rise of um, what's called second wave feminism. So I don't know if y'all have uh, you know, d discussed waves of feminism in um, sociology classes or even you know, maybe in one of the history, your history classes. Um, are these terms first wave and second wave familiar? Anybody? Okay, Rylan, you've heard these before? Okay, so what's the difference between first wave and second wave? Do you, do you remember that? Yeah, that was high school. So okay. I don't remember. <laughs> okay, so we're talking about first wave feminism. We're talking about kind of like the 19th and early 20th centuries, right? Um, you know, think you like, like women in big skirts and round hats with um, like like wearing um, wearing banners and carrying signs. Um, like I don't know if any of you all have seen Mary Poppins, right? You know, the, uh, you know, the uh, Mrs. Banks is a suffragette, right? And she's always going to meetings, you know, trying to get women to vote and that sort of thing. And when we're talking about first wave feminism, we're talking about this kind of fight for basic political rights for women, right? So the right to own property. The right to uh, you know you know the right um, to make deci custodial decisions about your own children, um, the right to have your own money, your own bank account, the right to vote. Does anybody know, by the way, what ye in what year British women were permitted to um, vote on the same terms as men? <laughs> 1928, so less than a century ago, right? There are people in Britain now who are still alive. Who, well, um, not who voted, would have voted for the first time in 1928, because they wouldn't. But they, they might like. But yeah, there are people who are still alive who were born before women could vote in Britain. Um, women could not earn a uh, could not earn a college degree um, until uh, 1878, and there was only one place they could do it at uh, Bedford College at the University of London. There were other there were colleges at Oxford and at Cambridge that were set up for women, but they were two miles away from the main campuses, and they didn't confer degrees. Right, so you could go to Girton or to Newnham or to Lady Margaret Hall, and you could take the same classes men would take, but it would be in an isolated place. And however well you did on the exams, you still wouldn't get a degree. Now you know it's, you could still you know go to a potential employer and say like, hey. You know, I completed the program at Gurdon College, you know, and you should, you know, thus hire me to do this thing. You have no proof. But yeah, yeah, you have, you have no, yeah, you have no, no certificate at the end of it that says you did. Still be like, you're lying. <laughs> <laughs> it's so crazy uh, how soon that is. Like, yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, the whole period we're talking about, right, mm -hmm. is from, you know, about 1760 to the present, and that's really like, in terms of the broad sweep of human history, right, this is a blink of an eye. And I mean, you know, it's, you know, 1963, um, I mean, you know, my, my mother was born in 1953, you know, like this is, this is very much within living memory. 
and kind of like we can see like just how much things have changed in the 60 or so years since the story was published. But one of the things that the story is demonstrating is that things actually, like despite all of this political progress that was being made, right, that things hadn't actually changed all that much for the average middle class woman in about 100 years, right? And that's what second wave feminism is concerned with, right? So you mentioned last time, Peyton, Virginia Woolf's concept of the androgynous mind. Can you remind us what that was all about? Um, basically the idea that men and women have the same mind, like they have the same intelligence, but uh -huh. just with different bodies. Yeah. I'm going to put some asterisks around this too, to just remind hey, like, hey everybody, vocab quiz work. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so this notion that men and women are intellectually and emotionally different from each other, uh, begins, at least in certain intellectual circles, to fall out of favor, right? And the basic idea behind second wave feminism is that women have a right, like not just to basic political participation, but also to personal satisfaction and a life outside of the home, right? That this whole notion of men and women occupying separate social spheres is an artificial division that has no reason for being and limits uh, women's <clears throat> possibilities for self-realization. So second wave feminists typically insisted on downplaying or reducing ideas that there were differences between men and women. Probably the key texts for second wave feminism are by the French writer, in, like in addition to, Wolf, to Wolf's uh, A Room of One's Own, and also most of her fiction. Um, a book by the French feminist Simone de Beauvoir called The Second Sex. and a, a book by an American woman by the name of Betty Friedan called The Feminine Mystique. And if we look at The Feminine Mystique in particular, it seems like especially analogous to what's going on with Susan Rawlins. Now, it's actually published in the same year as this story, so it's unlikely that Lessing would have actually read it before writing the story. But these, yeah, these, these kind of ideas are developing, like the, Lessing's story and for Dan's book like are clearly kind of percolating at the same time, right, out of the same set of issues. Um, so for Dan was a graduate of an elite women's college, I think, I think she went to Smith College, um, but I could be mistaken about that. And she kind of was working as a journalist. She was married, but she was also working. And she found that among her class cohort at Smith, that was unusual. That most of her classmates had in fact you know, like gone the expected middle class route of you know, marriage, family, big suburban house. And as she surveyed her classmates, she found that even though this was supposed to be, you know, the American dream, right, that large numbers of them felt deeply dissatisfied, often for reasons they couldn't clearly articulate. And, you know, Friedan comes to argue that, like, it's like look, like, you know, we've had this expensive elite education that has taught us to engage with the world and to want more out of life. And yet we are, like society continues to put us into situations where we're expected to you know, wear pearls while doing the vacuuming 
and um, you know, <laughs> stay, stay home and look after the look look after the children. Be appealing for hubby when he comes home, right? Produce a nice meal, um, and you know, continue to live as Victorian housewives did, but often without the household help that Victorian housewives had, right? So. <clears throat> The argument comes to be that you know that women essentially you know deserve their own careers and their own paths to self-fulfillment that are analogous to and equal to those of men. Right now, another thing that should be noted here is that this is a movement that would encompass people like Susan Rawlings, but probably not people like Mrs. Parks who does have to work outside the home, right? And this is a kind of key difference that second wave feminism often doesn't really, doesn't really recognize. Like, so second wave feminism tended to be very suburban and affluent feminism. It didn't take off among the working classes or among racial, racial minorities, in large part because it didn't really speak to their life experiences, right? You know, when you're talking to people who had all, you know, in which, you know, the women in the family had always had to work, often for these affluent families, um, <clears throat> these issues just didn't resonate, right? Because you would think Miss Parks, she's leaving her home to take care of someone else's home, but yeah. then return home to uh -huh. take her home as well. Uh, and she, yeah, she's more worried about this other person, her employer's home, right. than she is about hers, right? So, and I, I think that like this story is more sympathetic to Susan than it is to Mrs. Parks, but I think that that is kind of partly that second wave feminist class blind spot, right? This is not, by the way, to um, dismiss or to downplay you know, the very real emotional struggles that you know Susan has over the course of the story, right? Which again are caused, you know, by the intelligence, sensibility, and ra you know rationality of you know both you know of her upbringing and of everyone around her, right? And I think like one thing that I do kind of want to note here. Um, before we wrap this up, um, how does Susan's anxiety manifest itself? Like, what does she start thinking she sees? A demon. Yeah, she starts seeing like a demon or the devil, right? Mm -hmm. And what does this devil look like? He's ginger haired. Uh huh. Um, he has like a red fuzzy outfit. Is what she's uh huh. Uh, what page do you uh, I, I see it, 910, the nice. kind of middle paragraph there. Middle-aged, youngish, almost uh -huh. like immature. Yeah. Um, he was thin, and he's energetic. <laughs> <laughs> and, un and the jacket's unpleasant to touch, because it's hairy. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, let's let's like think about like this this image she has of the devil, right? So it's a man kind of red faced and red haired, right? In fact, she says gingery, right? So you know, it's meant to evoke like some kind of spicy, right? He's got this uncomfortable looking hairy jacket. He, wear, <laughs> he wears ugly boots. And he's always poking things with a stick, right? And there's a snake too. Yeah, she yeah she thinks she sees him like prodding a snake with a stick, right? So what do you what do you make of like that this is the image of the devil that she conjures up in her imagination? It doesn't look like Matthew, right? But it is a man, roughly Matthew's age. And he's always cooking and stuff, so it's like messing yeah. with people. Uh, yeah. And yeah, every every time yeah, every time she sees this figure, he's poking at something with a stick. 
whether it's the snake or his boots or whatever. Why do you think her, her anxiety manifests as an energetic man? Well, at least like the energetic part. I mean, she was talking about how she was so restless and like she just wanted to like be doing uh -huh. something or like had a really hard time if she okay. was at her house, like being still. So as yeah. like she's feeling that, it's not necessarily surprising that what she thinks she saw uh -huh. would have been very energetic. Yeah, in everything itself. about this guy suggests restlessness, right? I, yeah, I think that's good. Does it have to do with the idea of like? the men get to have this freedom that she doesn't get, so it's like the man's messing with her because he's like mocking her, like I get to do all this. And, you know. I, I, think, I think there may be something to that, right? Mm -hmm. Although like when she sees him, he's invading her home spaces, right? She either imagines him in the house stalking her or in the garden watching her, right? So I think there's also this kind of sense of surveillance here, like she's always being watched. And this, I think, is kind of part of what plays into her, um, how upset she gets when she finds out that Matthew knows about the hotel because it means that all this time she thought she was doing something private and unobserved, right? Matthew's been watching her, yeah. She has not been out from under his eye. And even when she goes back and look, looks at her own family through the window, right? It kind of shows how easy it is in a space like the one she occupies to surveil someone, right? If you've got someone out isolated in the suburbs, it's much easier to keep an eye on their comings and goings. And all this is to say, screw the suburbs. <laughs> Live in town. <laughs> okay, so we're about out of time here. Actually, like be, because I'm poorly organized today, um, and uh, I, I did I didn't bring my flash drive, so I don't have the reading questions for next time to give you. But I will email them to you when I get home. Um, and yeah, just remember to uh, you know fill out the course evals, read the poems, take the quiz, and yeah. Was it the, the quiz close Wednesday midnight? Close, it'll close Wednesday midnight. Okay. Okay.